Welcome to Real Leaders with Rashini, the podcast with real talk, real questions, real insight, and we hope real inspiration for real. I'm thrilled to welcome you to season two. We meet even more inspiring leaders who get real in all parts of their lives. You can find Real Leaders with Rashini on the radio.com app, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. My guest today is Laura Broad. She's executive director of Columbus Children's Foundation, but whoa, does she have a past. Laura, <laughs> where do we even start with you? Let's go back uh, to m- many years ago, really, when you were a regent for the University of Minnesota. You were a young regent. Uh, it's, I, I guess I was, um, but you know the regents are all active in different ways and in different parts of their career. And um, you know, being a regent at the University of Minnesota, which is a huge economic driver in the state, was a great opportunity, great learning experience, and the people there are just there for the right reason. So I love the experience. You also were a Minnesota state legislator, so very different from what you're doing now. But what were some of the highlights of that part of your life? Yeah, you know, I was an accidental politician, actually. I um, started a small business in in a small town of New Prague, Minnesota, and had two little kids at home, and there were some questions I had about how cities and government ran, and so I ultimately ended up running for city council, um, which led me into running for the state legislature after I told the Speaker of the House no five times that I wouldn't run convinced me by going over to my parents' house and getting me to run there. But anyway, so it was a great experience. And what I learned, um, I learned so many things, but it really it comes down to relationships. And building relationships with people you agree with and building relationships with people you don't agree with so that you better understand how to move issues forward. But I uh, loved all of the moments that I had there, both the moments that were great moments and the moments that I would love to take back. So what is your advice for people who might be thinking of running for elected office? Do it. Uh, You know, politics is a tough sport. So, um, you know, I often hear people say, well, politics today is so awful. It's just a... It's, a, it's so much different than it used to be, and I always tell them to tell that to Alexander Hamilton. You know, politics has been kind of a rough and tumble sport since its inception, and you got, we've got to get people who are there for the right reason, um, who are there to build relationships and move, move issues forward, and who are there to dive deeper than just the talking point. And so um, I love to recruit uh, people to run. I love to recruit women to run. Um, I think we need more people who want to spend a little bit of time there and then walk away. Yeah, these lifetime politicians. I'm a big believer in term limits. I wish we would have term limits in the United States Congress. My guess is you're a believer in those too. Well, I term limited myself. And so I think that, um, you know, while there's structural things that you can do like term limits, um, I, I do think that it's also incumbent about uh, incumbent upon politicians to have lives outside of the legislature, especially in Minnesota, which has a citizen's legislature. And the citizen's legislature brings together, and the reason I think it's so powerful is that it brings together people who have other parts of their life, their teachers, their doctors, their entrepreneurs, their moms, their dads, their grandparents. You know, it, it, it really brings, I think, a, a more um, diverse fabric uh, in terms of perspective to the table. And when you have politicians that are, are there, you know, they're in politics as a career, it definitely changes the ability to get outside perspectives and to have connection with people outside their zone. And so I'm a huge believer in um, the citizens' legislature, and I'm a huge believer in people um, having outside um, uh, work that they do, uh, again, whether it's uh, work for pay or work for volunteer. And then, even before you got into what you're doing currently, you became an executive in the tech industry. Tell us about that. Yeah, I've uh, made some pivoting uh, choices in my life, but, um, you know, being in the startup space in a very um, startup-rich environment in Minnesota has been a phenomenal experience. You know, I had the opportunity to build a small company that was built on a very amazing uh, uh, high technology and a nanotechnology space um, in the the biopharmaceutical space, if you will. Um, but to, you know, to really take a, a technology that is hard to understand and um, deliver 
the conversation around that technology to people who really want to know what it can do, right? How can that technology, which I don't actually understand, you know, just from the outside perspective, how can that actually help lives? How can that save people? What can I do to get involved um, in, in making that come to fruition? So the challenges associated with startups are real. Um, but the need for startups to be successful um, is, uh, I shouldn't say the need for it, but the existence of successful startups is partially because of a, a ecosystem that works for those startups. There's capital available, there's support available, there's great people involved. So being part of the biotech world in a high technology or a high science um, space has been uh, very challenging, um, but really exciting because it led me to where I'm at today. Let's talk about that. You are helping really the people that are sometimes left behind because they have ultra rare diseases. Yeah, ultra rare diseases are uh, actually not that rare. It's interesting that um, you know there's about 320 million people in the world with an ultra rare disease. One of two people diagnosed with an ultra rare disease are children. And when you think about the children with genetic diseases, three of 10 of them won't even reach their fifth birthday. So this ultra rare disease conversation is significant because it impacts a lot of people. Now the diseases that we're working with in the Columbus Children's Foundation are genetic, they're, they're genetic diseases that impact um, less than about 300 kids in the world. So these really are kids where there might be a, a, um, a, a clinically possible cure out there, but there's not a company that's able to move that cure forward because there's no ROI. So what our foundation does is essentially move cures from uh, great science to the clinic so that we can deliver treatments to kids with these ultra-rare diseases um, in a nonprofit model. So uh, the nonprofit model allows us to do it cheaper and allows us to, to uh, advance cures faster. And we support great scientists who just need a little bit of a push, either to bring um, different expertise to the table, funding to the table, or manufacturing to the table. Again, it's all focused on getting cures to kids who have these ultra-rare diseases diseases. That sounds complicated, but also inspiring. Give us a visual on one of these children. Yeah, so let me tell you about Irai. And Irai is actually a little girl from Spain. Um, these kids are all over the world. But Irai was born with a genetic malfunction, if you will, or a genetic misfire, a missing gene is kind of um, uh, you know, there's faulty genes, missing genes, kind of uh, malfunctioning genes are kind of the things, uh, um, you know, that, that create um, genetic diseases. So the um, Eri was born with uh, something called, I'll just, I'll just say it's called AADC deficiency, otherwise known as juvenile Parkinson's or infantile Parkinson's, which, by the way, most people don't no exists. <laughs> so we hear a lot about Parkinson's, but we don't hear about kids that are born with something similar to juvenile or similar to Parkinson's. So she, you know, essentially didn't have mobility in her, ar her arms, her legs. She doesn't walk. She doesn't talk. She has um, over two to 300 seizures a day um, and really has a very limited um, uh, prognosis with these genetic diseases. Um, we were able to support a program um, that uh, provided a gene therapy treatment, um, a fix, if you will, to her genes. And um, about 10 months post-surgery, Eri is going to preschool. So what our programs are intended to do is take um, you know, uh, kids with diseases that are life-threatening. These are not programs that make somebody's life a little bit better. These are kids who will die but for a treatment. And, um, and kind of infuse life back into them and their fa hope for their families. And watching uh, little e uh, get her hair done and go to school, is, it's pretty amazing. I got to tell you, it, it is absolutely uh, humanity at its best. Love it. Well, that is intense work. So you've got to unwind. You've got to let loose. 
What are some of your favorite ways to let loose? I love um, traveling. Uh, I love uh, reading. And um, I'm a bit of a Netflix uh, binge watcher. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, I just, I love to be out and about. You know, I, I take my dog on walks. I, uh, anytime I can get on a plane and land on a beach somewhere, I'm all in. <laughs> I am all in. I um, also enjoy dinners um, and you know, a nice bottle of wine with my family. We've got a, a blended crew of six kids that range from 24 to 12. Uh, so we've got a lot of moving parts. You do. You also have a fabulous husband. What are some of the ways that you keep it real and keep it romantic? Yeah, so we, what we do is we, um, he travels a lot too, and so we try to remember where we both are <laughs> in the country sometimes. Uh, sometimes I can't remember if he's on the East Coast time zone or the West Coast time zone, but we, we never go to bed without talking to each other. Uh, the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning, um, you know, and this is the moments when we're, we're apart, is, uh, is uh, text or talk to each other. Um, little little notes uh, or little calls during the day when we know we're both very, very busy just to uh, you know, remind uh, the other one that we're thinking about them. And then ultimately, when we're home, we like to go to dinner so that we can tune everybody out and just, um, just talk to each other or go out, go out with friends. We enjoy that too. I know you mentioned the wine, uh, so I know that you do like cocktails and wine. If... Uh, if Laura Broad Hamid was uh, a spirit or a wine or a cocktail, what would she be? Well, I'm glad you asked me that because I think I, I've heard this asked before and, and I think I was going to say water because it's pure <laughs> and clean and straightforward. But anyway, so, <laughs> so um, I think I'd be a glass of red wine. Um, you know, there's different layers to it. Um, y y when you sit down and drink a glass of wet red wine, it calms you, it's peaceful, it's meant to be an enjoyable experience. And um, I love being calm and peaceful, but I also love packing a punch, which some red wine does. <laughs> it truly does. All right, well, Laura, thank you so much. You're just a pleasure to talk with. Until next time, keep it real. <laughs>